Welcome to Prime 9, the countdown show that covers the very best in baseball. Guaranteed to start arguments, not end. In this episode, we've got the top nine players who never got to play in a World Series. Why nine? That's baseball. Nine players, nine innings. Prime 9. One of the ground rules for this show was that a player had to have played his entire career in the World Series era, which dates back to 1903. Mattingly hits one out of here. Holy cow! Four for five for Mattingly, an RBI number 145. What a year! And we didn't do this by position either. In fact, we have a nice mix of pitchers and everyday players throughout the show. Rippy leaps high in the air, and he's got it! One more thing. While there are a few Cubs on our list, we had to cut them off at some point. They are one out away from going down again. For when your team hasn't made it to a World Series since World War II, well, let's just say we could do a whole nother show altogether on fall classicless Cubs. Use that crossing in front of their dugout. It's not Lady Luck. So here we go with the nine best players to never play in a World Series, starting with number nine on Prime Nine. The toughest pitcher for me ever in 19 years to hit off was Phil Necro. He is known as Nuxy. During his 24-year career, it was not velocity, but it was a fluttering knuckleball that frustrated major league hitters and created a lot of jelly legs. You know, it's unhittable. It's a pitch that you swing and you could miss that ball by five or six inches. And I've seen guys do that. The knuckleball swing and a miss. He threw me a corkscrew knuckleball one day that went like this that I still wake up in the middle of the night seeing. It was like I, I couldn't believe it. When I'd swing at it, it was like I needed a tennis racket to hit him. He was, he was phenomenal. And durable. Phil's knuckleball did not put much stress on his arm or shoulder, so he didn't wear down as the season wore on. 1967 through 1982, a 16-year stretch. Negro averaged nearly 270 innings per year. Really a lot of quality, a lot of innings, and a lot of consistency. I've definitely got my share, more than my share, of wins in the big leagues. As they say, I think I've had my day in the sun as far as it comes to a career in baseball, but there's one thing I haven't done, and that's pitch the World Series. And he never did. For Phil's teams often finished below 500, and just twice did his Braves even reach the postseason, only to be quickly dismissed. Among all ball players in the World Series era, no pitcher pitched more innings, no player played in more seasons without reaching the World Series. There are a lot of great players that never played in the World Series. And certainly one of the greatest of them was Ryan Sandberg. Lawrence Ryan with a play, double play! Nice play, Rhino! He timed his leap perfectly! Rhino certainly was one of the best players that I had a chance to play against. You know, he hit with power, he could hit for average, clutch hitter. The only second baseman to hit 40 home runs in a season and steal 50 bases in another, Rhino could do it all. He stole home! He was as well-rounded player as I've seen. And as impressive as he was with the bat, Sandberg was like a vacuum at second. Rhino would give you the bat and he'd give you the defense. What a play by Ryan Sandberg! Defensively, uh, the gold gloves speak for themselves. Nine straight gold gloves from 83 through 91 speak volumes. And why does he win gold gloves? <laughs> Pretty easy to answer. He was as good a middle infielder as you were going to find. But one place you never found, Rhino, was on the game's biggest stage, playing for a title. My goal was to make it to a World Series. It's, it's tough to do. It really is tough to do, and not everybody gets to make it. He certainly tried. Sandberg had an MVP season in 84, leading the Cubs to their first postseason in 39 years, only to be eliminated in heartbreaking fashion. Ground ball hit the dirt, right through his leg! The Padres moved on, and when the Cubs returned to the LCS in 89, Sandberg hit 400 in the series. But it was not to be. They are one out away from going down 
again. And that's it. So this will add to the lore of the Cubs. Those were my two best chances to get the World Series, but uh, things didn't work out. Both times, although Chicago ultimately fell short, Sandberg did about everything one could ask for for a single player to help his team win. Welcome back to Prime 9, featuring the best players to never play in a World Series. We've made our case for 9 and 8, which means it's time for number 7. When the roll call of great shortstops is read, one name has to be included. Luke Appling is probably one of the best shortstops of all time. People say they really love to watch him play. I remember my dad talking about him and talking about the fact that there was no one who could stand at home plate and manipulate that bat around like he could. He was steady, steady, 300 hitter every year. And in fact, Luke Appling owns the record of highest batting average by a shortstop. He hit 388. Appling could really do so many good things on a baseball field. He could win batting titles. For his career, his on-base percentage is at 399. He could lead the league in putouts. He could lead the league in double plays. He could lead the league in assists from the shortstop position. So many wonderful things. You know, he played shortstop very well. All aches and pains, as they used to call him. That was his nickname. He said he, every day he went out there, he didn't feel well, but he'd go out and get two or three hits. Luke first played in the majors in 1930 and it seemed like he would never stop. Luke Appling had an exceptionally long major league career. Over 20 seasons, he was still playing regular shortstop in the majors at the age of 42. Unfortunately for Luke, those two decades he played for the White Sox were two of the worst in franchise history. Appling played on just five winning teams and never finished higher than third in his entire career. The irony is that once Appling retired after the 1950 season, the White Sox had a wonderful decade from 1951 to 1960, winning the pennant in 1959, but it was without Appling. Appling's misfortune was to have spent his entire career with a lot of also-run White Sox teams. There were no World Series appearances, but he was one of baseball's most notable shortstops for a long time. Hey, hey, holy mackerel, no doubt about it, the Cubs are on their way! Hey, hey! Ernie Banks was a singing, talking, dancing billboard that extolled the virtues and the joys of playing baseball. So, let's play too. The fact that Banks stayed so upbeat during his 19 years with the Cubs is amazing since he never once reached the World Series. I had dreams almost every night about playing in the World Series. And then I would wake up <laughs> in a cold sweat and say, gosh, it's not happening. Nor did it ever happen. But that was no fault of Ernie's. The first shortstop ever to hit 40 home runs in a season, he did so five times. Banks was also the first NL player to win back-to-back -back MVP awards in 58 and 59, and his numbers soon added up. That's a fly ball, deep the left, back, back, and that's it, that's it! But despite his Hall of Fame career, Ernie never even got close to a World Series until the end of his career. That was 1969, when the first place Cubs collapsed in September, adding to the belief that they were cursed. I don't know how this happened, but a black cat came on the field, and things just began to happen, and we didn't win. It is kind of sad that this man who found such great joy in the game never got to step on a ball field on the biggest stage in the World Series. Still, Ernie's demeanor never wavered. His unabashed love for the game endeared him to fans like few others and earned him a lasting nickname. Mr. Cub, that's always been his label here in Chicago, and he's, he's part of the city. Long after I'm not here, I'll still be here. <laughs> Welcome back to Prime 9, featuring the best players who never got to play in a World Series. Phil Necro and Ryan Sandberg checked in at 9 and 8, followed by Luke Appling and Mr. Cub, Ernie Banks. Which means it's time 
for number five. Ferguson Jenkins was no different than any other player. All he wanted was a ring. I think any of the great pitchers would have given up, whether it's a Cy Young Award or many of their all-star appearances, to pitch in the World Series. Unfortunately for Fergie, he just never got with that one team to get to the big stage. When he retired after 83, only six pitchers had played more than Fergie's 19 big league seasons without appearing in a fall classic. That was a tough row to hoe for one of the best pitchers of his generation. If you see a typical Ferguson Jenkins game, you're going to see a real operation. I got ahead of hitters early in the count because I threw a lot of strikes. I threw the ball by people a lot of times, especially fastballs. Strikeout number three for Jenkins. The stuff was what set Fergie apart, and the pinpoint accuracy with all of that stuff. Last year, Jenkins went 14 complete games without walking anybody. Jenkins was a rare combination of power. Number 3,000 in Fergie's career. And exemplary control. Year after year, hitters were overmatched. There's number 20 of the year for the sixth consecutive year. But much like his teammate, Ernie Banks, Fergie's road to a title was nipped by a cat. Ron Sandals in the on-deck circle, and the, and the cat walked right behind him, stopped right in front of our dugout, and just kind of peered in. Who's that crossing in front of their dugout? It's not Lady Luck. Everybody thinks that the, that black cat incident really hurt our ball club. Well, they did spiral out of first place, and Fergie never did get to a series. It was a bitter pill to swallow for a Hall of Fame pitcher. I would have loved to have gotten the World Series. A lot of players in our organization, the Cubs, Boston, and Texas never got there. I was just one of those players that worked hard enough to get to, to the playoffs, but just unfortunately just didn't get to that particular level, postseason play and then World Series play. No pitcher who never played in a World Series has more than this man's 3,534 strikeouts. Gaylord Perry was one of the best competitors I have ever seen. A smiling Gaylord Perry walking off the mound after a win makes giant fans happy. When it got to the real tough games or against the premier pitchers, Gaylord wanted the baseball. I expect to pitch every four days and I expect to pitch nine innings. The Iron Man of the League, Perry completed 23 games in 1970. I didn't want to uh, let anybody else finish my games. I thought I could do the job myself. That relentless drive led Perry to pitch at least 250 innings 12 times in his career. But it was his trick pitch that whetted the appetites of his fans. Whenever anybody talks about Gaylord Perry, the word spitter is going to be a necessary and integral part of that conversation. I'm trying to get that dirt off of that spot right there. Okay, I'm ready now. The set, here it comes. Swung on and missed. Reggie is human. But no matter how often he was throwing it, Perry also brought a wonderful repertoire of pitches to the mound. That arsenal helped Perry become the first pitcher ever to win the Cy Young Award in both leagues. But for a variety of reasons, he never reached the Fall Classic. There's the essence of lousy timing. Perry was a rookie in 1962 with the San Francisco Giants. But as a rookie, Perry really had a very small part in that pennant winning season and was not even part of the ball club as they faced the Yankees in the World Series. Perry's best chance came in 1971, but his Giants fell to Pittsburgh in the NLCS. He spent the rest of his 22-year career with seven other teams, none of which made it to the World Series. He's a Hall of Famer, but he has no ring. That's uh, probably one of the very small disappointments he's had in his career, in a career, by the way, that had so many highlights that we would never have enough time to talk about it. And he cleaned up the first baseman, number 35, Frank Thomas. The first thing you, you notice is his size. He didn't have really a power swing. He was just so big that he'd hit line drives out of the park. Uh oh, get out, Frank Thomas! Home run, Big Hurt! Oh, Lord, he killed that one! I was a hitter, and I always thought like a hitter. My job was to drive the ball to all fields and not think about home runs. One of the best swings in all of baseball. If you get the right pitch in the right spot when your mechanics are right, home runs happen. What strength and power for Frank Thomas. The man they called the Big Hurts was a career 300 hitter. 
many of those hits went deep into the night. The 21st player in big league history with 500 home runs. A five-time All-Star, Frank also won back-to-back -back MVP awards. Gee, I think I'll trick Frank Thomas with his two-old breaking ball. Not. In his 1993 MVP season, Thomas led the White Sox into postseason play where they fell to the defending champion, Blue Jays. The Blue Jays played like champions. The White Sox just came up short. You know, we fell a little short. I really felt we could have won the World Series. I felt we were the best team in baseball that year. They were, in fact, one of the best teams in baseball in 2005, when they won the World Series for the first time in 88 years. But as bad luck would have it, an injured Thomas was unable to play. Thomas played his last game in July that year, battling foot problems all year long. Thomas was relegated to a spectator, to cheerleader, sitting in the dugout with his uniform on as the White Sox swept the Astros to win the World Series. For the first time in 88 years, the World Series trophy is going to Chicago. I gotta thank these guys, man. They put me on that bag and carry me across the finish line. It was a bittersweet moment for Frank, for his team had won a World Series, one in which he never got to play. We now return to Prime Nine, where in this episode, we're featuring the nine best players who never got the chance to play in a World Series. These are talented men, some Hall of Famers, but they all missed out on the chance for a ring. Here now are the top two World Series no-shows, the greatest players never to set foot on a fall classic stage. We begin with number two. Obviously one of the great hitters of all time, Rod Carew. If you never got to see Rod Carew, you missed something. Rod Carew, baseball's perfect master of the bat. Everybody know that Rod Carew is a mutation with the bat. It isn't sorcery, just more pure hitting talent than anyone has seen in a long, long time. I would simply say the best hitter that I ever faced, period. He's the best hitter, incontestably in baseball since Williamson Musial. Consider for a moment what Rod Carew accomplished in his career. Rookie of the Year, an MVP award, seven American League batting titles. That's right, set 15 consecutive seasons hitting 300. And there's a drive to left field, base hit. There's number 3,000 for Carew. Despite all those individual accomplishments, he never had a chance to play in the World Series. It just doesn't quite seem right. Oh, he got close in both 69 and 70. But both years, his twins got swept aside in the LCS by the pitching rich Orioles. We weren't as strong as they were. I felt eventually that. Um, that they were going to beat us. His next postseason appearance came in 1979 in his first year with the Angels. But the story was kind of the same. The Angels met the Orioles in the LCS and lost three games to one. It finally looked like Rod would make it in 1982 when the Angels took a commanding lead on the Brewers in the best of five LCS. The California Angels have won the first two of the 1982 American League Championship Series. And this time, the Angels looked like they were on their way, and then watched as the Brewers came back and won three straight. The Brewers have won the American League pennant! We had a chance to win a game to go to the World Series, but, you know, that's the way baseball goes. Rod went on to finish his career with more hits than any player in the World Series era not to reach the Fall Classic. It's a pain that will never go away. You can win batting titles and MVPs and go to all-star games, but when you come close and not get to the World Series, uh, that, was, that was one of the toughest things for me. Ken Griffey Jr., when you start talking about the all-time great center fielders, how can he not be one of the top three or four guys that you're going to bring up? Holy smoke! He, at one point in the game, did pretty much anything he wanted to. And you're flying diamond makes the catch! Really enjoyed the game. One of his nicknames was The Kid, and he acted like a kid. Murphy leaps high in the air, and he's got it! Oh, An incredible oh, catch oh. by The Kid! Ken Griffey Jr. all but owned the 90s. The youngest all-century player, Ken Griffey Jr. 
The cornerstone of a talented and dynamic team, Griffey first tasted postseason play in 95 against the Yankees. Rips a deep, goodbye home run. And his electrifying sprint around the bases in game five punctuated a stretch that saved baseball in Seattle. Fans accepted the Seattle Mariners as an organization. The city embraced everybody on the team. The Mariners didn't reach the World Series that year, but with so much talent, they appeared on the cusp of a dominant run. 1997, when the team's superstars were having superstar-like seasons, Griffey probably put together his best all-around season in his career. This team really looked primed and ready to make a run at the World Series. They lost in four games to the Baltimore Orioles and we're out of the playoffs once again. We just didn't do what we wanted, but uh, we've got four and a half months to think about it. For Griffey, it would be a lifetime, for although he reached milestones in Cincinnati, the World Series was not to be. Number 600 for Ken Griffey Jr. No man hit more home runs without playing in the Fall Classic. All Junior can do is reflect on the joys of the game he so loved. For the most part, if you go out there and give yourself a chance to win, you're gonna win. And that's all you can ask for in this game, the chance to win. Griffey is just one reason why it's hard to believe those Mariners teams of the late 90s never reached the World Series. For beyond Junior, who was arguably the best player in baseball at that time, they also had the game's premier designated hitter. There was also a precocious young talent who was emerging as one of the game's superstar shortstops. That is gonna be caught by Rodriguez! An amazing catch by Alex! And on the mound, Seattle had the big unit, one of the most dominant and successful pitchers baseball has ever seen. How good is this guy? One of the best. There was a wealth of riches in Seattle in those years. But there was one jewel missing from this gem of a team, a ring. That's our Prime Nine. What's yours? <laughs>